you may need to turn your volume up for this one. It's a low volume recording. Hello, you, you fan. I'm going to sing a song with you called Shine On Me. It's an amazing spiritual that anybody can sing. And in these days when the things that we're dealing with, the feeling separate and all of that, and things seem so hard, this is one of those songs that you just throw your head back, put it in your medicine kit. All you have to do is ask. And here's how it goes. Shine on me. Oh, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse shine on me, oh, shine on me, yes, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse shine on me lift me up oh lift me up let the light from the lighthouse lift me up oh lift Yes, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Oh, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. Let the light. From the light, from the lighthouse, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. So hold me close. Let the light from the lighthouse, please, hold me close. So shine. Shine on me. Let the light, Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light. From the lighthouse, About uh, 10 years ago, a decade ago, I was serving my internship with our, our congregation on another hill across the bay in Kensington. We had a mosaic artist come in to facilitate a few big art projects with the congregation. And for one, we invited the kids and, and adults, everybody to, to bring toys. Um, particular kinds of toys, those plastic soldiers, little green army men, other toys of war and violence, and toys also of a different kind of violence, Barbies and princess attire. 
several hours and a significant amount of hot glue later, the assembled army was surrounded by pieces of broken mirror and shaped into the form of a dove. I'll show you a picture of it. Painted white guns, painted white tanks disappeared into this ancient sign of peace. Pistols and Barbie dolls fanned out together to create a feathered tail. A knife became the delicate arching neck, a war plane transformed into the tip of a wing. It it echoed another project on the congregation's land 20 years before when handguns had been collected after a particularly brutal streak of violence in Richmond. When handguns had been collected and welded into the base of a sculpture of a plowshare. As we lift our gazes, not to what stands between us, but what stands before us, we close the divide because we know to put the future first, we must first put aside our differences. And the poet spoke, we lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, not because, but because, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to that in our time, she said, then the victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made, that is the promise to glade the hill we climb. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. I know that this is one of those tricky words, those wounded words we've been talking about in our, our lunchtime theology series, but I can't help but hear in the poetry of Amanda Gorman that arrested our attention this week, a vision of salvation. Salvation, not otherworldly salvation, but here and now, not a personal redemption, but a collective reckoning, a collective movement toward the dawn of a new horizon. And everyone neath a vine and fig tree shall live in peace and unafraid, and into plowshares turn their swords, nations shall learn war no more. And into plowshares turn their swords, nations shall learn war no more. Many noticed, pointed out this week that the way Gorman used that line, it echoes the way the line is sung in the musical Hamilton. The way that Lin-Manuel Miranda captures George Washington's beloved piece of scripture from Gorman to Manuel Miranda to George Washington back to the ancient poets. It's from Micah 4.4. God will judge between many peoples. Will settle disputes for na strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone, 
everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid. This prophetic voice, this prophetic voice emerging, erupting again and again in human history, again and again in the artist's brush, in the performer's speech, in the poet's words, this vision of the dove, of the vine and fig tree. It was the scripture that George Washington quoted as he made what may have been his most important, most consequential contribution to our American story, deciding to leave the presidency after just two terms, 150 years before term limits would come about while the emerging nation clamored for him to stay and maintain the strong and steady presence of his leadership. It would have been easier to let the past become the future to shape the mold of president even more closely to that of monarch, for Washington to serve out his life as leader. But instead he began a tradition, a tradition that we were so moved to witness continue on Wednesday, one that we felt threatened, perhaps more so than any time in at least a long time. A tradition of a peaceful transition of power. I will teach them how to say goodbye, Lin-Manuel Miranda imagines Washington telling Hamilton as they discuss his farewell address. I'll teach them how to say goodbye. It's the address where he famously lifted up the importance of unity, described loyalty to party over country as the worst enemy of government. It's because being American is more than a pride we inherit, she said. It's the past we step into and how we repair it because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. For while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. What a powerful invitation. An invitation into a real and rooted relationship to time calling us to awareness of the way history and future live in us now, in this moment, calling us out of the pride we inherit, one of those delusions, the shadow of imagination we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, released from a delusional story of pumped up pride of American exceptionalism, we become liberated to engage the past on its terms, to gaze into the future with awareness of history's eyes on us. Because the truth is, we need to see the past clearly before we can imagine where we are going. Sometimes we need to see before we can imagine. In fact, I think there's a way in which that's, that's always true. The imagination is always rooted in the real, in the visible in what we have seen and experiences. See a vice president who looks so different than any before her. And what that does to our imaginations. See history real in its festering wounds yet untended, allowing us to imagine what repair is needed. Sometimes we must see first in order to imagine. This is why rich and vibrant art always accompanies a prophetic movement for change. We must see it, feel it, be given a glimpse so that we can imagine becoming it. And this is uh, 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 coming down to the very personal and the mund mundane, but I've been feeling this viscerally in my life this month. Some of you know I've been starting my, my house hunt. 
uh, for a, a long-term home in earnest this month, trying to, to purchase a house with, with my brother here in the East Bay. And I, I'm not gonna go into the absolutely overwhelming details of it all, but I've, I've noticed in visiting homes and trying to imagine wildly different lives, trying to project out many years into the future and somehow see it making some sort of sense while borrowing more money than I ever imagined. First, I, I flip through all the photos, read all the information, use Google Maps to calculate the drive times between each house in Henry's school, the church. But I found it's not until I see it, <laughs> viscerally experience it, drive up, look across the street, wander the rooms that I know if I can imagine the future it would hold. As I traversed from a neat and tidy, very small duplex within walking distance to Henry's school to the wild landscape of a sprawling fixer-upper in the hills, a friend commented how amazing it is to be contemplating such wildly different visions for my life based just on what happens to be available on the real estate market at the moment. It's a, a fascinating thing. Surprising to parts of us, I think, but all vision, all imagining must be rooted in relationship to what already is, to what has been, to what has formed our now. And as we all know, all too well. What has been, what already is, is in so many ways a mess. We've inherited a mess. As we felt the dawning of a new day this week, many of us so moved, perhaps more than we expected. I heard from many of you that sense of surprise at the tears that came watching those rituals and symbols unfold at the inauguration. As we feel the dawning of a new day, the hope and relief was also mingled with the ready awareness of the challenges still present. The festering wound as Adrian Marie Brown named it, the inherited struggles of our shared past. You know, some speak about slavery as the original sin of our country or perhaps white supremacy at large, the genocide of native peoples, all the evil perpetuated from the delusional colonial mindset. Original sin though, it's such a, a unhelpful idea, isn't it? It speaks to an inherent brokenness, a state of, of perpetual shame and inadequacy. It's one of the key theological ideas we fundamentally reject as Unitarian Universalists. And yet it, it has such staying power because it speaks to a true and important dynamic. We do inherit, we do inherit ancient wounds. We are not born tabula rasa, blank slates, but born into context, into a story already unfolding, the complexity of its plot beyond our capacity for understanding with core conflicts and struggles for which we become responsible merely by our being born. Not an original sin, but an original struggle, an original wound, which has become ours to care for, to tend, to heal and transform. In the vast stage of our national story, our global story, and in the small stage of each of our personal narratives, the lives of our families, May we be blessed by these poets' words as we work to climb whatever hill looms next. Every breath from my bronze-pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the windswept northeast. 
where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Thank you.